Okay, this last part is to go over capillaries, okay? All right, so capillaries, capillaries are gonna be our smallest blood vessels and our small and these smallest blood vessels are gonna help us with exchanging substances. They're gonna exchange substances between blood and the interstitial space or interstitial fluid. Let's just say blood and body tissues maybe. Sure. Okay, so since they are the smallest of all blood vessels, they have the smallest circular diameter. This, uh, these dogs are killing me. This size is about the same size as a red blood cell. So about the same size as, as, as a red blood cell diameter. You know, like, I don't know, just put yourself a little like red blood cell in there and that's it's big, basically the same size. Okay. All right. So when we look at uh, the structure of a capillary, the capillaries have to be the thinnest ones. So they only have a tunica intima. Yes, I mean, all the other ones are thin in one layer too. I just wanted to make sure you guys understand that it has no tunica media, no tunica externa. That's how capillaries are actually special, okay? Uh, I forgot, oh, what I put down here. In terms of special features, capillaries have something called precapillary sphincters. These pre-capillary sphincters basically help control the flow of blood. So what that means is if I need more blood flow to an area, they'll open up and allow more blood to flow into a capillary bed. If I don't need blood flowing to that area, the pre-capillary sphincter will close off and like less blood will flow to that area. You wanna think about this in terms of uh, when we think about supplying towards, you know, certain organs during certain time periods, basically meaning like during rest or digest, you'll have a higher amount of blood flowing in the capillaries around the digestive system and less blood flowing to the muscles. So this is where precapillary sphincters can help us. Okay. There are three different types of capillaries. One is called continuous. The continuous capillaries are a complete sheet of, of uh, epithelial tissue or endothelium, whatever, epithelial cells that all connect one to another one. The fenestrated ones, these have tiny pores in them. So think about like nice little openings so it's easier for capillary exchange to happen. You can move stuff out really easily and you can move stuff in really easily. And then the last ty type is called sinusoidal. The sinusoidal have large holes. Those pretty big, large holes are going to allow for uh, blood cells to move through. So like red blood cells and white blood cells. So sinusoidal are usually found in places like the bone marrow and the spleen and the liver whereas fenestrated are found in places where you do a lot of capillary exchange. So at places like the digestive system and uh, the kidneys usually as well. Okay. So since capillaries do ca uh, capillary exchange, I'm gonna go over capillary exchange with you guys. And yes, I had, why is that already there? Because this is video shoot number two because something interrupted me mid video. So now I have to, had to redo my video.
All right, so magic of television or whatever here. We're going to see that we have our capillary. Okay. Maybe this is a good thing. Then I can start off really, really well this time. So on one side, we have the arteriole. Okay, on the, in the middle, we have the capillary. Ah, I don't wanna write that right there. I'll just write it in the middle. And then on the other end, we have a venule. Okay, remember the arteriole is coming from the heart, the venule is going back to the heart. And what we're gonna see is that we're gonna have blood. Right. So on the arteriole side, what we're going to see that is since we're coming off the heart, we're going to have high blood pressure, which means we have high mean arterial pressure. Right. Our mean arterial pressure is just taking systolic and diastolic into account. That's that's all it's doing, essentially. And what we want to understand is when we talk about blood pressure. We want to remember blood pressure is equated to blood volume and, and the size of our blood vessel. Okay, so in this case, we wanna think that blood volume is contributing more to blood pressure right now. And since blood volume includes blood, I mean, it says blood, blood, right? And blood is 55% water, we're gonna think about this in terms of water, okay? Thinking about that in terms of H2O, this can all come into play. Essentially, as blood enters into the arteriole, there's two important things that you need to take care of or think about when you think about capillary exchange. One is the amount of water, okay? The amount of H2O is going to equate to hydrostatic pressure. Pressure is simply a force. So in this case, what it's saying is hydrostatic pressure is the force of water on the wall of the blood vessel. That's all. Water is gonna hit the blood vessel and it's gonna bounce back into the capillary normally. Like It's like touching the wall and then you bounce back. You touch the wall and you bounce back, okay? In this case though, sometimes the water can escape through the capillary wall because the capillary wall has openings in it. Not really big openings but also it can actually move through the cell itself and then out the other side. The other thing that we need to take into account is the fact that inside of blood, we have these large plasma proteins, okay? These large plasma proteins are albumin. So basically albumin concentration, we can equate that to osmotic pressure. Okay, so osmotic pressure has to do with osmosis, and osmosis has to do with the pull of water towards a solute. In this case, our solute is albumin. Alb albumin is basically going to pull water towards it. As the concentration of albumin increases, you pull more water. That's what's going to happen. Okay, so we have to think about you have, in this case, we have albumin. We're going to put albumin all through our capillary even over to our venule. And you also have to have molecules of water. So since we just picked up substances, right, and we're coming from the left side of the heart, blood pressure is really high. When we talk about blood pressure, we're talking about blood volume. So you have a large blood volume, you have a really small size, pressure is gonna be really high here. Essentially on the arteriole side, I know I have a lot of stuff going on here, but uh, I'll write this in black. What we're gonna see is we're gonna have a high hydrostatic pressure on the arteriole side. What that means is I have a lot of water that's gonna hit the walls of the capillary. Outside of the capillary, we have body cells. All right, those are our body tissues. And the space between the capillary wall and the body tissues is filled with interstitial fluid.
What is that fluid? It's water and substances. So again, you're gonna have water outside here, particles of water and some substances, okay? But the amount of water outside of the capillary is much less. So what that tells us is that hydrostatic pressure is actually lower. Since hydrostatic pressure is lower, we want to remember the fact that we are always, we're, for the most part, we're gonna move from a high concentration area to a low concentration area and a high pressure area to a low pressure area. So essentially what that means is water is going to be forced out of the capillary here. Okay, so water keeps getting forced out of the capillary on both sides. And as water gets forced out, sometimes substances follow that water. If you have a fenestrated capillary, a fenestrated capillary would have these tiny little pores in them, not big enough for the albumin to move through. And if you have a sinusoidal, then we have a really big, really, really big opening where albumin could also leave too. So in this case, it's gonna be much easier for water to move out like that. And I'm gonna erase this part because I don't want that on that side. You can just think about like a big sinusoidal opening right there. Okay, water is gonna be forced out a lot easier. So hi hydrostatic pressure is gonna cause water to be pushed out of the capillary on the arterial side. What that means is I need a high enough map. Remember how map was about profusion or about capillary exchange, making sure enough substances are sent towards organs and body cells and body tissues. So what this is saying is if blood pressure isn't high enough, you don't have a high enough hydrostatic pressure to force water out of the capillary. So that means oxygen, water, nutrients are not gonna be sent to the body cells when it needs it, okay? That's why MAP is important. On the venual side, what happens is you've lost a lot of water. So now the number of water molecules has decreased. And as the result of water molecules decreasing, what ends up happening is on the venual side, hydrostatic pressure dips. Okay, there's not enough force to push everything out anymore, which is good because we don't want to force it out. What that means is like, you got a lot more water out here anyway. Okay, I lost a whole bunch of volume. Even my capillary is gonna be the same size, but I lost a whole bunch of volume. And as I lost that volume, that means pressure is gonna go down overall, right? So like here I have a high blood pressure, which is like a high MAP like that. Over on the venule side, blood pressure decreases, right? And this is a result of the fact that we have a decrease in blood volume and an increase in size of our blood vessel. Remember, venules are much, the venule is going to be bigger than the arteriole is. So you've lost all this content. And if I don't want blood pressure to be at zero, which is, I don't want blood pressure to be at zero here, then what I'm gonna need to do is I'm gonna need to make sure I pull water back in. But I can't pull water back in because of hydrostatic pressure because hydrostatic pressure on the outside is not high enough. Hydrostatic pressure on the outside is probably about the same pressure at it as it is on the inside. The only thing I have is osmotic pressure, okay? So on the arterial side, osmotic pressure is, osmotic pressure, it's the same. You have albumin there but you have more water. So it's more important that hydrostatic pressure is important on the arterial side. On the venule side, because you have fewer water molecules, so over here you have less, well, let, me, let me write this in black. Here you have less H2O and you have more albumin, okay? What ends up happening is your osmotic pressure is higher than hydrostatic pressure, okay? Really, you want to equate that to, oh, I have way more albumin because I lost all this water. 
And now as you have more albumin, what albumin is going to do is it's going to pull the water from the interstitial space back into the capillary, right? Because remember, osmotic pressure is the pull of water. Uh, I was going to say, osmotic pressure is solutes pull on water. Okay, so here we have a higher concentration of albumin. Because we have a whole bunch of albumin, water gets drawn or pulled towards albumin. That's going to help us bump up our blood pressure a little bit so that as our water leaves, which should not be green, it should be blue. As our water leaves, we still have some enough pressure. We have enough pressure, okay? We don't have a lot of pressure because we lost a lot of fluid, but we didn't lose all of our fluid. If we lost all of our fluid, that would be a really bad thing. Like basically you kind of get all swollen and die, which is really bad. So this is how capillary exchange works. Arterial side, hydrostatic pressure, if it's high enough, pushes water out. On the venule side, osmotic pressure needs to be high enough to pull water back in. Okay, that's how capillary exchange works.